about. Okay, so um, this is all that we just talked about, radiation, but let's talk about cold. In order to understand this, there's a couple of things you must understand. It has to do with the concept of nuclear deterrence. Can someone explain that to me? Nuclear deterrence. You have to understand the words. Hopefully you understand the deterrence. If I'm going to deter you from breaking into my house, what will I have done? Stop you from doing it. I, I didn't stop you mid-break, right? If I deter you, I prevent you from even making the attempt. That's deterrence. I deter you. So it's like I, I'm making you go on a different path. So nuclear deterrence means that nuclear weapons prevent war. Not stop war that's already going. It prevents war. How does this happen? Well, this is super easy. Can someone explain this to me? Yeah, kind of, kind of. Mutually assured destruction, though, we use this in a perverse way. We don't understand. We don't understand its context. Mutually assured destruction becomes a policy, right? It becomes a policy, but it's not originally a policy. This is abstract. You guys are smart. I know you can handle this. Originally, it's a description. Can someone explain to me the difference between mutually assured destruction as a policy and mutually assured destruction as a description? Go ahead. As a policy, you're going out of your way to ensure that if something happens, like you're setting up that situation. As a yes. description, it's something that happened as a side effect of something else. Yes, that is exactly right. You guys are very smart. Okay, cost-benefit analysis. Hopefully you guys understand this concept of cost-benefit analysis. Okay, so the price that we pay in order to get this benefit, if the price of that benefit is too much, you don't do it. If your candy bar costs $1,000, you're not buying the candy bar. You're not going to get $1,000 worth of enjoyment for the 30 seconds it takes to eat it. Okay? Now, if the candy bar is a nickel, boom. Cost is low, benefit high. Okay? If you happen to be allergic to chocolate, they could be giving it away, and you're not going to do it because there's no benefit. Super easy, right? You understand cost-benefit analysis. In terms of military, you fight, which means you risk lives and money, and if you don't get a benefit, you're not going to do it. In the old world, the old world order, Your foreign politics, global politics, was based on cost-benefit analysis. Very pragmatic. Remember I used that term? If you're in my world history, I use that term a lot. In the United States, I only use the term when I'm talking about the World War I. And I'm explaining why it is that the United States doesn't want to have anything to do with World War I. Because when we look at the European foreign policy, what we see is pragmatism. These people are not making decisions because it's necessarily the right decision. They're making decisions because they think they can get some benefit. And war has no special or perverse role than anything else. If the war will achieve this end, then we do war. If diplomacy will achieve the end, then we do diplomacy. If money will do it, we'll do money. We don't take it off the table. For the United States, our approach to foreign policy was very much ideological. And for ideological approach, it's either right or it's wrong, right? We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among these life will be pursued happiness. We don't like empires. We don't like dictatorships. We think democracies are not only a good thing, but it's really the only thing in order to achieve peace. We see peace as an ideal. We are not pacifists, but that's the happy situation that we should be striving for. Pragmatism, we're upset with. Nevertheless, we also recognize it. Okay? Because if, if you don't operate 
from ideological perspectives. You need to make an argument that's pragmatic. If you're the United States and you're trying to talk to all these European countries about, you don't need to get into World War I, and they all say, that's very nice, go away. Then you have to give them something else, something more pragmatic. And that's what we do after World War I. When we get to World War I, we don't have a choice in the matter. We are in the global arena. We don't choose to go in through the UN or to the League of Nations. We're not part of that European apparatus. We're separate. But we're involved. With World War II, we are in a leading position. So we, as best we can, we try to use our ideology as best we can. We truly believe that all men are endowed by the Creator, so none of the rights in it. You don't respect those rights, you're going to have wars. The United Nations Declaration of Human Rights is basically this applied to the global arena. But nevertheless, like we understood with Hitler, like we understood with the Soviet Union, they don't deal in ideology, they deal in terms of pragmatism. One of the problems with the 1930s appeasement was that the European countries suddenly were converted to the ideology that the United States brought to the table after World War I. France and England, especially England, they're true believers in this. And so they try to deal with the growing um, Hitler menace in an ideological perspective. We'll sit, we'll negotiate, we'll talk. But Hitler could care less about ideology, could care less about human rights. Hitler is all about pragmatism. And so when these guys talk to each other, who's going to have the upper hand? On the short term, not in the long term, but in the short term. The pragmatic guy. He looks at democracy, for example, as, as like a handcuff. You are telling me that you are going to abide by those laws? Great. I'm going to make up all sorts of laws that will restrict your behavior. And since I could care less about the laws, I'm going to do whatever I want to. This was the lesson of appeasement. This is the lesson that the United States and the West take away from World War II. You can't do appeasement. You can't negotiate with people that are dealing with pragmatism. When we're done with World War II, we talk to Stalin, and it's very clear Stalin is in the same mindset that Hitler was. For Stalin, it's about cost versus benefit. For him, during the war, he's going to get as much as he can. There's no concept in his mind that it would be better for Poland or Germany or for these other countries to decide for themselves what country they want. It's just not ever in his calculus. He wants to go into Berlin first because he wants as much as he can. Wherever those tanks go, that's where he is. It's expansion. Post-World War II, we have this option. What are we going to do? Are we going to try to do the appeasement stuff? like we did in the 30s with Hitler, that didn't work. Are we going to go full force fighting? We're going to just eliminate that cancer? Are we going to destroy the Soviet Union? No, that doesn't work either. So we took that middle path, containment. And what containment is, it's basically applying pragmatic principles wherever you can't apply the ideological. You simply contain it. When we deal with the Soviet Union, we deal with cost-benefit analysis. But for us, who want peace, we deal with law. So nuclear deterrence. We invented nuclear weapons. And please, you have to understand this. You really need to understand this. When we invent nuclear weapons, when we're working on this, there is no soul searching. I don't care what Hollywood tries to paint to you. These people are not racking themselves Oh, this is terrible. Should I do this? Should I not? No, no, no. This is a big bomb. They don't think of it as a nuclear bomb. They think of it as a big bomb. The bigger, the most efficient bomb that will save lives. They're doing this in the midst of the war. There's people already dying. Thousands of them. If they could end it quicker, then of course you're going to do it. If you can get a magic gun that you push the button and it kills all the bad guys, boom, they do it in a heartbeat. There's no moral struggle over this. They are inventing the nuclear weapon to end the war. 
There's no racial component. There's no, we don't like those guys. None of that stuff. Because when they're building it, they don't know what it's going to do. They know it's like a chemical approach. TNT is a chemical approach. This is just taking it to another level. They know they can do it. Theoretically, they can do it. Why not? It has nothing to do with the matter of destruction. You guys understand this. I think I talked about this. We dumped more stuff on Dresden, Germany and destroyed Dresden, Germany far worse than what happened to Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Far worse. The difference is that we used thousands and thousands and thousands of planes over a couple of days to destroy Dresden. For Nagasaki, for Hiroshima, one plane, one bomb. That's the difference. Later, later, we discover radiation. We don't know this. How do we know we don't know this? Because the people who are building the bomb are sitting right next to it. They go and they're playing right in there. Then they get sick. If they knew about it, they wouldn't have gotten sick, right? This makes perfect sense. Once we understand radiation, once we see what's happening in Nagasaki and Hiroshima after the fact, then suddenly these nuclear weapons take on a different character. These aren't just big bombs. They're really completely different era. Really destructive. These aren't things that you can just throw out like you can do a thousand airplane loads of bombs. This, this is a different type. It's a non-conventional weapon. We don't think of that until after the war. After we've used it. Then the moral struggles that we talk about, that's when people start having them. And you can look back, and since we have moral qualms today, we think, oh, they must have had it then. No, they didn't have them at all. It took Harry Truman all of about 35 seconds to decide to drop his bomb. Hey, we have a bomb. Good, drop it. That's it. There's no moral decision. Is it going to save lives? Yes. Could it end the war? Yes. Do it. Not even a question. Today, would we make that decision so lightly? Because the weapon is different. Nuclear deterrence. Part of it is based on this fact that the weapon increases the cost, not just a little bit, but by a magnitude, five times, ten times, hundred times, a thousand times. The costs are astronomical. Now, I'm going to let you in on a secret. And the secret is, is that the costs of nuclear weapons are now political. And I'm also going to say almost mythical. We've been talking about impression, right? Perception versus reality. I spent a lot of time talking about this on my Monday class, my Monday night class. The perception versus reality. We use this when we were talking about the domestic policies. The, the, the Nixon-Kennedy debates in 1960, where we like Kennedy because he's a good-looking guy. Really nothing to do about his ability. But we talked about it by the death of Kennedy, the fact that we started attributing things to his administration that really never happened. But because he died, he was a young guy, a good-looking guy, we kind of elevate him as a martyr. The same thing happens in forest policy. How many of you have heard that we have enough weapons in our arsenals of the world combined that we could destroy the world seven, ten times over? How many of you have heard that? Whether you believe it or not, how many of you have heard that? Okay, it's just flat wrong. If you actually go through the chemistry, the nuclear weapons and you see what the footprint of a nuclear weapon is. Okay? And then you calculate that footprint times the number of weapons that are in existence. You get a size about the size of the state of New Jersey. Yes? But wouldn't, like, if, like say, if everybody blew up their nuclear weapons at once, wouldn't the radiation basically kill like, everybody? That's the theory, right? In fact, they had a whole movie the day after was a movie. 
that they did this. There's the on the beach, repeatedly. If you want a depressing movie, this is just almost painfully depressing. 1960. It's about basically the the bombs, and it didn't really destroy very much. But then the cloud of radiation slowly swept over the globe and killed everybody. Out. Is it real though? Now, before I go into the specifics here. Let me put it this way. Nuclear weapons are now political. What's the advantage of us being utterly scared to death of nuclear weapons? The cost becomes always prohibitive. There's no such thing as a tactical nuclear weapon. There's no such thing as using it just a little bit. And you have to understand this. I don't mean this just in a physical way. I mean this in a kind of a psychological way. What would happen if we did make a tiny little nuclear weapon, maybe a quarter of the size of the one that's in uh, uh, Hiroshima? And we could do that. There's no problem at all. So we just zip out that battlefield or that battlefield. Right? What would happen? to the perception of nuclear weapons. Right now, they are unconventional. When we were fighting in Korea, General MacArthur, he wanted to use a nuclear weapon to end this war. We had them, they didn't, why not? And Truman said, no! MacArthur was upset, he was actually a little belligerent. He ended up going into Korea in a spot where he wasn't supposed to. And what did Truman do about that? You guys happen to remember? Pull them home. You're fired. You, you, you can't not only go outside of civil control, but you have to be under control. If you used a nuclear weapon in that skirmish, then what would we be setting the precedent for? You could use it any time. It's not special. If you have tactical nuclear weapons, what's the difference between tactical and non-tactical. Where's that line where this is okay and that's not okay? What we did is we made the entire class of weapons unconventional. And we emphasize it. And we tell our students, this nuclear war, you know, we say things like, I don't know what World War III is going to be like, but I do know that World War IV <laughs> Why? And I'm not challenging this. What I'm saying is that this is a political purpose because it matters. The costs are so astronomically high, what possible benefit could we ever get from this? So we blow them up, they blow them up. What do we win? Nothing. Nothing. Okay. Now, the description versus the policy. Ten minutes. Let's see if I can explain this. This is when Reagan died. And this isn't a pro-Republican. This was, when he dies, Republicans, Democrats, pretty much consensus. Kill the Cold War, the Cold War, the Berlin Wall, so we, that's what people associate with Reagan. It's the ending of the Cold War. How does he do this? Well, we need to go back just a tiny bit one more time and remember weapons. Now, in our brain, we think, well, little suitcase, take it over, this is my nuclear weapon. I set it there, mark a sorry. The fact of the matter is, we can't make a nuclear weapon smaller than, say, twice the three sizes the time of a, of a refrigerator. Okay? There's no such thing as a suitcase bomb. We don't have the ability. Just in terms of the chemistry. Okay? So maybe you can get down to the size of a refrigerator. The problem has always been, okay, so you get this suitcase, let's pretend it was a suitcase. How do you get away from it, right? Delivery is always a big important issue, especially if it's a really big bomb, right? So I drop it off there and then I'm running as fast as I can. How big does that fuse have to be? And if it's long enough for me to actually go, then what can anyone else do 
while we're waiting for it. Disabled, right? So we have to come up with some solution. And one of the solutions, and we, we thought about this in the 1950s, we could try to do rockets because Hitler was using rockets in World War II. And we decided that that was a failed approach. And instead, we went with supercarriers. And I think I talked about this. What's a supercarrier? It's an aircraft carrier, right? Big, giant aircraft carrier. What can be on these aircraft carriers? Farmers. Right? Get on. And the beauty about the supercarrier is that you just go right outside of wherever it is. The guy gets on the airplane. He flies. He drops the bomb. And he's out. And he doesn't get hit. You're up high enough so that by the time it's coming down, you are speeding away. Now the thing is, the more powerful these bombs are, the higher you've got to be, because you cannot get out quick enough. So this is a problem, but this was our solution. We did this, this was our solution in the 1950s. And then what happens in 1957? So this is our approach to the nuclear weapons. In the 50s. We're just going to use bombers. We create long-range bombers, some that can go from the United States, fly to the Soviet Union, and return. And we have these carriers anywhere. But then what happens in 1957? Do you remember? Anybody? What's the next? And this scares the bejesus out of us. It's nothing. It's a basketball. They send a basketball and they have it in orbit. But if they can put a basketball in orbit, what else can they do? Bombs. Bombs. So this launches the space race. And the space race is all about being able to use rockets now to do this. And so this is where we get all of our initials. We have ICBMs, IRBMs, SLBMs, ABMs, MIRBs. Intercontinental ballistic missile. These were not invented until the 1960s. Because we could not get a rocket to go from one continent to the next until we knew how to do it. And how did we learn how to do this? Space program. If we can get a person up to the moon and back safely, then we can take this big refrigerator and ship it over to Ru uh, uh, Russia without any problems. Intercontinental ballistic missiles. These start in the 60s. Prior to this, you have intermediate range, IR ballistic missiles. Short range ballistic missiles. SLBMs, or I say SLBS, submersible launched ballistic missiles. These are ones that can be done from a submarine, which is kind of an expansion off of your supercarrier. Short range, which means you can put this on a boat. Now, in the 1960s, we thought we were behind because. Russia put Sputnik up. We didn't, we didn't put any energy in our rockets. Which is one of the reasons why we get so concerned about the Cuban Missile Crisis. Because what does Cuba have, or what does Russia have in Cuba? What do they want to put in Cuba? They don't have to have ICBMs. All they need are short-range ballistic missiles. And that would be sufficient. 80 miles is not that far. You can do a conventional weapon that far. That's why we get upset about it. The fact of the matter is, and we didn't know this then, but we do know this now, they didn't have anywhere close to about doing that ability. It took them about 10 years to be able to invent an ICBM. Now, in the process, we come up with all sorts of solutions. The ABM, what's an ABM? Anti-ballistic missile. This is like shooting a bullet to hit a bullet in flight. This is how fast these things are going. Can you imagine doing this? Do you know why we have personal computers now and you have your little cell phone in your hand? Because we were developing computer technology to be able to do things like that. There's no way you could do it by saying, okay, now, shoot it now. Your brain, this human is never going to happen. But if you get computerized models and then they do it for you, this is how it comes. This is why you have the technology today, frankly, is that the research went into that type of stuff. Anti-ballistic missiles. In 1970, we didn't think it was possible. But we went heavy into it. Not because we were actually putting a lot of energy into it. But we were hoping that the Soviets would put money into it. Why would we hope that? Because we didn't think it was possible. 
Do we want them putting money in ABMs, which we don't think is possible, or would we like them putting money into ICBMs? But if they think that we have a gun that can shoot a bullet with a bullet, what happens if they don't have one? What happens to their entire arsenal if we have a successful ABM? It's shot, right? So they got to put money into it. We deliberately had this treaty called the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. We said, okay, we will promise not to build any ABMs as long as you promise it to. So the Union said, no problem. Now, the Soviet Union, did they ever abide by their treaties? No. Never, not a one. We would abide by it, but the reason why we were willing to abide by it is that we knew it was a dead-end idea. And we knew that the Soviet Union wouldn't abide by it, and so we were hoping that they would continue to dump money into it. And they did. They spent the 70s trying to get into this. It didn't work. Now, the improvement on computers it's very rapid. By the 1980s, Reagan comes up and he has this idea of SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative, using computers to do ABM, but not in the old-fashioned way, a bullet with a bullet. We're thinking lasers. Laser. Pretty significant. Star Wars is what he called it. And the Democrats, the people that are opposed to this, have called it Star Wars to make fun of it. But guess what? That is what we have today. It actually works, right? You can use a laser to shoot out something else. What am I talking about here? We've got about a minute and a half. ABM, or excuse me, MAD. MAD as a policy means that you are trying to ensure a balance. Now, this will guarantee deterrence, and that's our goal, right? We don't want war. We want the, the price to always be high and the benefits to always be low. But there's a problem with this. And the problem is that if you follow MAD as a policy, when will it ever end? It'll never end. At first, we don't do it as a policy, it's just a reality. But after the 60s, with the ICBMs and all this technology, we become real conscious of it, we pursue it as a policy. Reagan was against mutually assured destruction. He made this argument. The U.S. is a free society. Remember, all men are endowed with a career with certain animal rights, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Soviets are not. Okay? And so because of this, the Americans are always going to have an advantage. So none of this staging of balance. No balance. We do not want a balance. We want to win, right? And by winning, what we mean is we want to end the war. And so what he does is he has a two-prong approach. And the two-prong approach means that on the one hand, he is going to increase the price of war more than you ever imagined. He's going to dump money into it. For us, that is doubling our gross GMP from 4% to 8%. So we double the amount of money we spend on the military. For the Soviet Union, because they're not a free society, they were already spending close to 49% of their gross domestic policy. If they have to double their expenditures, what's that going to get? 98% on the military? If they want to be even with us, if they want to be equal with us, we can double it again if we need to, and they're out. Double prong policy. We put one, if we're going to dump in our military as soon as we can, the other, we're going to have diplomacy, and at every point we're going to say, you know what, we don't actually have to do this. If you want to, we can stop any moment. Just agree to get rid of these things. Not a balance, not keeping us and maintaining a certain level, just flat out get rid of it. This is a two-prong attack. When you start this in the beginning, when he starts this in the beginning, the Soviet Union just pretty much laughs at us, because they're thinking, you know, they're old appeasement type of stuff. And Reagan says, okay, we'll just keep building, we'll keep building. And there's no way you can catch up. And they couldn't. What was happening, the Soviet Union tried, and then they started seeing their country get weakened, beginning to implode. And right about 1985, they realized they couldn't sustain this, and then they started doing the diplomacy. We started having peace talks left and right. And before Reagan left office, they came up with this an agreement called the START Agreement, Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, which means we're actually going to start getting rid of these things. And that was the beginning of the end. Unfortunately for the Soviet Union, good for us, but unfortunately for them, 
They had already put so much into it, they couldn't recover. By 1989, they realized that they've got their fingers all over the globe and they cannot sustain it. And they started to have breakdowns. And the first breakdowns were in Eastern Europe. They couldn't maintain the guards. There were too many people. So they opened one door, one little area, and they just removed the guards. They wanted to see what happened. I remember this. People were flooding. Thousands of people were flooding through that gate. Thousands to escape. So what you need to realize is that's the pressure. A month later, what they do is they go into Berlin and they just simply call the guards home. They don't tell anybody, there's no press release, there's nothing, they just simply leave. And for half the day, the Berlin folks are sitting there and they realize, I don't see any people there, I don't see any machine guns. And then about in the afternoon, and there's news, it's just buzzing everywhere. People go there, they walk through, nobody gets shot. And you can imagine the courage, because that's what people used to do, was get shot over the Berlin Wall. Nobody's getting shot. They can't find anybody. By that evening, they realize there's nobody there. They're climbing on the wall and nobody's doing anything. That's when you see the pictures of saying, okay, let's go home, get the sledgehammers, and they start pounding it. That's the fall of the Berlin. What happened is that the Soviet Union simply could not maintain these outward posts. And it's the beginning of the end. That's in 89, the Berlin Wall, fall, wall falls. Within two years, by 91, the whole Soviet Union implodes. The two-prong attack. It's not just making the price very high by putting extra money in the military. At the same time, we say to the Soviets, anytime you want to, we can end this. Because if you remember, our goal is not pragmatism. Our goal is this ideology, the rule of law. If you want to get out of that, if you want to join us, you can do it any time. And it worked, so you didn't collapse. Now the question I started at the very beginning of the class. Soviet Union is gone, right? Soviet Union is gone. Does that mean that the Cold War is over? The Soviet Union was the biggest leader in that rule of might type of a camp. But not the only leader. So is it over? Very good question. Questions, comments? Words of wisdom. See you guys on Wednesday.